So thanks to Michael for the introduction. Um, really, my title should have a subtitle, Aquinas' account of natural law and some questions that it raises. The Aquinas Colloquium two years ago was on Aquinas on the development of law. And Michael wanted me, in a sense, to launch this series by giving an altered and adapted version of the paper I gave at that colloquium. The colloquium issued in four articles in Law and Justice, the Christian Law Review number 183, and I've rather shamelessly adapted this paper from what I published there. So if you want to quote me, then ask me which bit of the original paper I'm talking about, and you can quote it accurately. I've given you on the first page of the handout um, references to that issue of law and justice and other works by J. Budzhizhevsky, who spoke at that colloquium, and his commentaries on Aquinas are extremely helpful. And I've given you some other um, bibliography as well, in case you want to follow things up. I don't agree 100% with everything in the bibliography. And I should issue a caveat that I'm not qualified to say much about the whole history of the concept of natural law, nor much at all about modern moral philosophy or theology. On page two of the handout, I make a couple of important preliminary points. One is that for Aquinas, law, and that means all law, is an act of reason. He defines it as a promulgated ordination of reason directed towards the common good made by one who has care of the community. And that distances Aquinas from what I understand of Occam, who sees law as an imposition of will, and to some extent from Suarez, the Jesuit key theologian um, and philosopher, who also sees law as an act of will, but for law to be worthy of its name, it must accord with reason. But going back to Aquinas in the 13th century, who says law is an act of reason, to core, I think can be refreshing and also challenging, because although we have a duty in conscience to obey law, we also have a duty in conscience to receive law rationally. We aren't able to abdicate the responsibility to recognize when a law or a command is unjust and may or must be disobeyed. And there's an important virtue in Aristotle and Aquinas, epiaikia, sometimes translated equity, which is the virtue of recognizing when the letter of some detailed law must be set aside in a strange circumstance to achieve the purpose of the law. And a related point is that for Aquinas, as a general rule, God commands things because they are good. It's not that they are good because God commands them. The second preliminary point is to suggest briefly how law fits within a bigger context in St. Thomas. Arguably it's subordinate to virtue certainly both law and virtue make sense only within the common pursuit of eudaimonia. Beatitude, fulfillment, flourishing, well-being. 
So my little Technicolor chart suggests that we start where Aquinas and Aristotle start their moral treatise with the ultimate goal, which for Aquinas is the beatitude of knowing God, sharing God's own happiness. But that typically affirms the human well being, which is the business of natural law and human law, is what I've put in green on the right of the little chart. There's a huge natural law component to Catholic moral theology, to St. Thomas's moral theology, because human well being is entirely valid, though it's in a sense relativized by having God and God's own bliss as our goal. And fulfillment, beatitude, eudaimonia are achieved by acts. So good human acts bring human fulfillment. That's the green um, hollow arrow on the right and meritorious acts enlivened by charity lead us into beatitude and for St Thomas the virtue of charity and the virtues that come from God and go with charity can so to speak embrace and elevate all our natural good acts to make them also meritorious, part of a journey lived into eternal life. So St Thomas's moral teaching starts higher than law with that pursuit of beatitude, and it embraces what is more particular than law, particular acts, which hopefully are chosen by a well-formed conscience. Virtue then comes in as facilitating acts that lead to fulfillment. Both the acquired virtues of Aristotle and the God given virtues and gifts that St Thomas recognizes coming from grace. And then human law is basically to make us virtuous. Human law is to facilitate the development of virtue and to inhibit vice. And on the Christian graced side, then the sacraments and other things prescribed by the divine law enable us to receive the God given virtues and gifts. So those are two preliminary points, but my first main point is what's shown in the chart on page three of the handout. St Thomas on the unfolding of law. There's a clear structure to the different kinds of law that St Thomas recognises. And it's very useful to get a sense of that structure. And the structure raises questions, some of which I will um, go into some detail about in the final part of my paper. So on page three, the whole structure starts with what St Thomas calls the eternal law which is in fact God's wisdom as governing everything. So God's guiding and governing wisdom is the starting point of all law. And then that leads to two kinds of law. On the left, there is natural law. On the right, there is divine law that is to say, law posited, put forward by God. So on the left, the natural law flows from the eternal law. And 
Thomas sees natural law as the participation by the rational cre creature in God's eternal law. God gives us a share in a reflection of his own wisdom so that we can govern ourselves responsibly. And we do so as rational animals. And that means we need to be sensitive to the whole of human nature, including then its animal components. And it means that we are able to formulate a body of precepts because the rational animal is the linguistic animal and we enact propositions, theoretical and practical. Human language typically involves propositions of various kinds, statements of theory and purpose. So the natural law will be a hierarchical body of precepts hierarchical because reason does sometimes step back to look at the overall shape of things and sometimes focuses in on details. Decades ago, when I began giving tutorials on Aquinas, I was puzzled when I looked at Prima Secundae questions 90 to 97 which seemed to be Aquinas's treatise on law in the Summer Theologiae, because I was expecting to find a list of natural law precepts, um, like thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not use artificial contraceptives. And what I found was something that seemed rather different St. Thomas discussing how we can formulate various precepts by reflection on our natural inclinations. And a few very general precepts appeared, but no clear list. And I discovered in due course that to find the clear list, or something that's moving towards a clear list, you have to look at St. Thomas's treatise on the Old Law, the Old Testament, or in particular the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament as a book of law. And it's in question 99, article two, and in question 100, that we find detailed natural law precepts. So there is a hierarchical body of precepts and they unfold. And so in fact, we can't quite ignore the treatise on the old law in St. Thomas when we try to understand what's in the natural law, at least as far as he sees it. And he gives us a kind of threefold structure of the unfolding of law, of natural law. So the first two levels in that structure are what he calls primary precepts. And it's at the third level that you find detailed precepts, which he calls secondary. So there's a bit of terminological confusion if you aren't careful. What is most primary is what is obvious to everyone, and you can't think differently. So in the question on the natural law itself, Prima Secundae 94, the precept to do good and avoid evil is automatically built into human thinking you can't think differently. And clearly that has some connection with 
what he calls synderesis earlier, conscience strictly so called, is a rational decision about what you have done, whether it was right or wrong, or what you should do. But synderesis is an inbuilt habit, an inbuilt structuring of the intellect, where you find built into us the absolutely first principles of reasoning, like the principle of non-contradiction. You can't think that the same thing can be true and false at the same time. And likewise, the basic principle of practical reasoning, you must do good and avoid evil. That's built into us, you can't think otherwise. But as the treatise of St. Thomas unfolds, we find that the golden rule, do to others what you want them to do to you, is also obvious. We can't think otherwise. And the commands to love God and to love our neighbor are also obvious. That might be a question for discussion. I'm not sure everyone would agree with that. But St. Thomas seems to think that as soon as you recognize that a creator exists by reason, as Plato and Aristotle did, or by revelation, as many of us do, it's obvious that you must love the creator above all things. And as soon as you recognize that we are engaged together in a common pursuit of eudaimonia, it's obvious that we must love each other. So that seems absolutely obvious and basic, but it raises some questions. And then to develop natural law, we have to unfold some other precepts by reflection on our natural inclinations. What is built into us by way of drives towards fulfillment? Reflecting on that, we can formulate what is clearly dehumanizing and should be ruled out, and what is clearly humanizing and is obligatory. And that should be obvious, but in a fallen world, the obvious can be obscured. And so God reveals these second level, but still absolutely primary precepts when he speaks the Ten Commandments. And in Exodus and Deuteronomy, the Ten Commandments are presented as spoken directly by God, which for St. Thomas implies that in fact they are absolutely obvious to everyone on basic reflection on what is good or bad for us. So no one can really deny the Ten Commandments, St. Thomas thinks. And there might be some discussion about that, whether in fact corrupt customs and warped thinking has made some of the Decalogue obscure to some people, or whether, as Professor Budzhizhevsky holds, it's still obvious to everyone that you shouldn't kill and you shouldn't steal and so on. And what, and the problem that is raised by sinfulness is that we sometimes think that things which are obviously against the Ten Commandments in fact, don't count. That might be an interesting question for discussion. But then many, many other natural law precepts, the secondary precepts, have to be unfolded and 
basically that's done by further reflection by wise people. It's not an easy task. So we have to unfold over time detailed natural law precepts. Because it's difficult, because wise people are in short supply in a fallen world and so on, God in fact reveals lots of these lower level natural law precepts and they are there in the Torah the book of law with which the Old Testament begins. Things like rise up before the hoary head, you stand in the presence of elderly people and so on. So St. Thomas thinks that God has done the job for us, at least to some extent, that's a further issue of discussion. God has revealed to us many things that it would in fact be a little bit difficult to work out for ourselves. So by bringing together the explicit treatise on the natural law in Prima Secunde 94, and what's in the treatise on the Old Testament and its moral precepts helps us flesh out a structured account of the natural law as seen by St. Thomas. More briefly, there's also something called human law, the law made by states, by complete human societies. And that St. Thomas sees, and it's on the left hand side of that chart, that's a task for wise lawgivers who apply the natural law to particular social, geographical, economic, and so on conditions. And of course, human law must develop as conditions change. It must also develop so as to apply the natural law better. And it's a noble and demanding task. It requires what he calls legislative prudence, a special virtue, a special mindset. And that involves, among other things, experience. But it must be met by political prudence, the wisdom of wise citizens receiving the law of the lawgivers wisely by the kind of things I mentioned a bit earlier. There's been a question about the handout which Michael has put in the chat section and I emailed the people who'd registered but um, if you haven't, if you're only registered very recently and not got the handout then I can send it to you later when I can have a look at the um, list of current registrations. Or you can email me directly. <clears throat> so there's a process of unfolding from the eternal law through the natural law in its various stages down to human law, which applies the natural law wisely and prudently to changing situations. And it's at least sometimes a task in progress of actually applying the natural law better. And the Old Testament, as understood by St. Thomas and many other 13th century theologians, contained what he called judicial precepts civil law and political arrangements which suited the Jewish people for many centuries but aren't now obligatory in detail 
because each society has to do with the job. But the judicial precepts in the Old Testament serve as an exemplar of what each society must do in its own place and time. There were also religious observances, ceremonial precepts. And the divine law, the law put forward by God, includes therefore the old law, the Torah, with which the Old Testament begins, but also with the new law, which in one sense is the New Testament, and especially our Lord's teaching as a kind of book of law, but more deeply, it is the grace of the Holy Spirit who comes to us to be our personal guide for the journey into God. To go into that would be a whole course on the theology of grace and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So that is St. Thomas's account of the unfolding of law. And I've given you on pages five to six of the handout a note on the secondary precepts. But it's clear enough that various questions arise which are worth discussing, including does the unfolding of the secondary precepts continue? Is the human race still engaged in discovering and formulating details of the natural law? And we've heard St. Thomas speak of the wise, the unfolding of natural law precepts is the task of the wise, and that seems to be both wise lawgivers and wise philosophers, because it's exemplified in the Old Testament by Moses, the monarch, and Aaron, the high priest, delivering to the people the secondary precepts of the natural law. And it's the same people, the wise people, who develop and apply human state law. So is there meant to be a kind of slightly fuzzy interface between natural law and human law? Is the business of developing human law and discovering more natural law an interwoven task? So that leads me on to the third and final part of my paper, which is to identify various questions that deserve discussion. And I've listed them and given some little account of them on pages four to 10 of the handout. And obviously we can't look at all of them. Um, so I'll mention very briefly um, the first few. The first question, which I've already um, hinted at, is, is it obvious to everyone that the precept to love God and the precept to love our neighbour, um, are those precepts obvious to everyone or did they have to be revealed by God and reaffirmed by Jesus? So would everyone agree that if God exists, he self-evidently deserves love, worship and thanksgiving and so on? And the second question I identify um, is what are the natural inclinations that are involved in deducing the more detailed natural law precepts? And I think that will be something to discuss next week in response to Will Nolan's paper. And the third question that I've already touched on um, is whether the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, needed to be revealed and why? 
I've mentioned that St. Thomas thinks that the Ten Commandments are obvious deductions from the most basic precepts, requiring brief thought that anyone can manage. He thinks that humanity's grasp of the natural law weakened as sin's hold increased, and that's why God had to reveal the Ten Commandments, because people's judgment had been obscured by false persuasion, corrupt customs, and various vices. So there's a question where I wonder whether Professor Budzhizhevsky has quite got what St. Thomas says right. He thinks that the Decalogue remains obvious to everyone, but certain people count certain behaviours as not contravening the Decalogue when in fact they do. And there certainly are contemporary analogies for that kind of thing, because I think everyone would agree that murder is wrong. No one can think that murder is right, but plenty of people defend abortion and euthanasia, and they claim that abortion and euthanasia don't count as murder. But it may be that St Thomas thought that it's also possible to miss some of the obvious things in the Ten Commandments. That would be worth discussing. Um, one could also um, discuss what would have happened in an unfallen world if there had been no original sin? How many of the primary and secondary precepts might need to be revealed in an unfallen world? And how easy would it have been to deduce all the detailed precepts? Certainly political life would have had to develop as time went on. But I think a more interesting question is number six, which I mention on page six of the handout. How do we discern what in the Torah is in fact natural law? Because St. Thomas seems to be breaking new ground in identifying in the Torah some natural law precepts um, besides the Ten Commandments. And that seems to be an interaction between revelation and reason, working out what in the Torah has become obsolete with the advent of Christ and what is perennially valid. Because obviously the New Testament affirms the natural law is perennially valid. And it seems clear enough that St. Thomas um, is in interaction with the Jewish tradition on such subjects because he quotes Maimonides with approval as giving us a window into the Jewish reflection of many centuries onto how to receive the Old Testament law. But perhaps the main question, questions to discuss would be what I've called seven, eight and nine on the handout. So question seven that I identify is is the body of secondary natural law precepts in the Torah meant to be complete, either as Aquinas sees it, or as scripture was intended by God? <clears throat> or is humanity's understanding of the natural law still unfolding in a cooperative effort? Obviously, new developments in society 
in economics and technology call for new applications of perennial principles. So one controversial example was when the contraceptive pill was developed. Um, the church debated, theologians debated, whether that was or was not against the natural law, and Paul VI decided that it was. Or organ transplants, are they legitimate or not? Many other questions are raised by modern biotechnology and medical possibilities, and so on and so forth. But are we able to formulate new precepts in a cooperative effort, aided by revelation and grace, drawing on authentic discoveries about human nature, human psychology, human biology? And so at the end of my handout, I give what I call some test cases, which I'll skip forward to and then come back. One would be capital punishment. That's on page nine of the handout, if you can see the handout. Thou shalt not kill is in the Ten Commandments. It's a primary precept. It's indispensable, Aquinas would say. Of course, we have a natural right to self-defense, but that should not aim at killing, but only restraining the attacker. But the Old Testament allows for capital punishment and Aquinas allows for it. How should we understand precepts concerning capital punishment. My suggestion is that they express a natural law requirement for society to defend its members against gross injustice. And each society has to make its own determinations, but I think it has to be done with the implicit proviso that all of these must yield to the higher authority of thou shalt not kill as and when possible. So once a certain stage of social organization has been reached, other means of restraining crime become not just possible but obligatory. And we can formulate a natural law precept to the effect that capital punishment should not be used. And the papacy in recent decades has arguably done that. But there might be something more to be said because Aquinas justifies capital punishment by likening the criminal to a gangrenous member of the body politic. And just as you can amputate a gangrenous finger to save the whole body, you can kill certain kinds of criminals to save the body politic. But in reaction to Nazism, Pius XII ruled out that way of thinking of the human being as a member of a body in too literal a way. So perhaps the development of papal teaching on capital punishment hasn't just responded to new possibilities for restraining crime, but it has exorcised what might be a pagan way of seeing the relationship between the human being and society. It's contrary to human dignity to see the human being as literally a member of a body. So maybe a dialogue has gone on between scripture, the Ten Commandments, Christian views of the human dignity, 
modern strands in philosophy and politics and not just Christian strands. And a response to the experience of what Nazism and Stalinism can do. So a rational dialogue has re-examined something that St. Thomas took for granted and formulated in one sense, a new natural law precept against capital punishment. That would be one interesting way of examining the history of that issue. And then my question eight, top of page seven, um, we can add to the natural law by divine law and human law, we can interpret some precepts with greater precision so that during the Maccabean Wars, the Jewish soldiers realized that the prohibition of work on the Sabbath didn't mean you couldn't fight a battle to save your society on the Sabbath. But can we perhaps alter what's in the Torah if it was rather culture bound? One small example might be Aquinas's identification of the precept rise up before the hoary head is standing in the presence of the elderly the universal way to show respect to them, or can it vary from one society to another? More interestingly, what about usury? The Old Testament forbids usury, and arguably usury remains wrong. But in modern economic life, not all charging of interest counts as usury. What loan sharks do is usury and is mortal sin, but perhaps certain kinds of ethical investment are not usury. Is that altering an Old Testament precept or simply applying it to a more complex society? There were interesting questions there. And then what I said about capital punishment might illustrate a further question. How are further secondary natural law precepts to be deduced? They aren't deduced in a kind of abstract syllogistic way, the way geometry might work. Clearly, we have to reflect on the inbuilt human inclinations reflect on human nature and psychology to see what makes for and what thwarts human fulfillment. And perhaps the development of further natural law precepts must draw on further discoveries, more detailed knowledge of human nature and what conduces to true flourishing Do we work at the interface between human law and natural law, between philosophy, theology, scripture, and so on and so forth? That's the kind of interesting question that I think St. Thomas's treatise does throw up. And I think that's probably an appropriate point at which for me, me to, to stop and to hand over to you for reactions, reflections, questions and complaints. So I would commend to you um, for reflection what I say at the end about the development of laws on slavery, because it seems to me that the Old Testament itself shows a development of the laws about slavery 
which points in the direction of the ongoing um, reflection on slavery, which fairly clearly has led to everyone agreeing on a new natural law precept that slavery is intrinsically wrong. So that's enough for me, over to you.